you don't have to be uh, a white man in a pinstripe suit anymore to be in the wine business. But whiteness dominates. We're very, very bad, I think, on racial diversity. It was, for me, it was never such a big deal. I, I didn't think that I needed to see anybody that looked like me to be able to do, to do those things that I saw other people doing because I felt like, you know, because my mother told me that I could do it, that I could be this person, I could be anything that I could. Um, I didn't realize the power of that until much later. And so actually until, you know, I started, you know, I started the wine company and, you know, I get hundreds and hundreds, you know, maybe even thousands of emails a month from people who look like me saying they want to do what I do and how do, how do they do it? And, and the fact that they didn't even know that it existed. The more you and the wonderful Jancis Robinsons, and I'm not calling her out, I said wonderful, remember, the, uh, bring these other folks up people are gonna say, holy, holy shit, you exist, Andre Mack, Gary Obligacion, Tanisha Townsend, uh, 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 Julia Coney, you guys exist, this is amazing. I can do that too, I wanna be a wine writer, I wanna be a wine critic, I wanna be a wine judge, I wanna be an MW, I wanna be all these things that unfortunately my parents weren't able to tell me about because we didn't know about it. Jancis Robinson was one of our first guests, a few days really, after we started this whole thing, Real Business of Wine on the 17th of March. And we obviously had no idea of what was going to be in the headlines of newspapers, what we'd all be thinking about and talking about today. The world has moved on and exploded in so many ways over the last, what, eight or ten weeks. Yeah, I, I think that you and I had a, a vision in our mind that we were going to start to explore the business of wine as it as it had been and the impact of COVID. And then the world changed so rapidly. And when I look back on those three clips, which were some of our earliest ones, and I think the the state that the world is right now, I understand that actually our job isn't to just reflect upon the way that we've always done things, but to affect a change in how we continue to grow and flourish as an industry. And that, that was my key takeaway from the past season. And I think the point that Dolin was making there was it was actually about the business of wine. It's the talent, the huge amounts of talent that we as an industry have not actually been giving space to that we could benefit from. And it's because we've had blinders on, I think. And this yeah. isn't just a matter of race. This is, in fact, uh, how we do business. This is how we grow. This is how we market, which is such an evil word in wine. And we have looked through uh, a very closed lens for far too long. And I think that's also true in terms of, of demographics. You've got the whole story of uh, millennials and do millennials see things differently or not? And I think that was very interesting listening to blogger Amber Lebeau talking about how she and her generation actually see sustainable wines, for example. Yeah, definitely, we are a very large cohort, um, but we're very different from both ends. I mean, I'm part of the old millennial groups. I mean, we're about to enter our 40s, but yet the youngest members of our generation are still in college. So it is hard to paint us with a broad brush. Mm -hmm. But you are right, Robert, in that we aren't adopting wine in the same way, partly because I think we're so aware of all our other options. I mean, you mentioned cannabis, and I'd probably be remiss for my American friend's Happy 420 Day. But there's all the other options, like, you know, cocktails are huge. One of the things that surprised me most since I moved from the U.S. to Paris was how much millennials my age in Paris at Apero are drinking cocktails or beer more than wine. I mean, I'm in, I'm in France, I expected more wine, but that's taken a lot. And then of course we see also in the US things like hard seltzer coming about and just about anything that we could drink. I mean, to be kind of blunt, we're a little bit of slutty boozers. We're not really loyal to any one category and that's unfortunate reality for a lot of wine producers. Exactly. And to see the work that she's done now with her virtual wine events, where she has discovered as a result of the past 12 weeks, just like we have, that the face of wine communication is changing. In fact, as Dan Jago spoke about, that we are living in a world of infinite substitutions. So we must get our, our practices and our messaging and our representation uh, on, on par in a retail environment is this thing called infinite substitution. Um, and infinite substitution has always been, for me, the thing that holds you back in this industry, is that no matter what you put on the shelf, there'll be something else available, either side of it, normally for 20 meters either side of it, which will do the same job. 
And I think the other thing is distinctiveness. This is one of the points that having Randall Graham, who's been an old friend of mine and one of my heroes in the wine industry, going out and doing something completely different that isn't necessarily part of a natural or any of the other uh, tribes, but going out and saying, I want to do something that's about me as a wine producer that actually is unique and that is going to send a message to consumers of various kinds around the world. Well, a lot of the things that I'm doing make zero economic sense, none whatsoever. I mean, the idea of developing new grapes that take eight or 10 years to develop and iterate, you, 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 it's very hard to make the business case for that. You really can't. So I haven't yet figured out how to monetize that particular aspect. But I think ultimately, the, the point of the exercise is differentiation. And I think unless you have differentiated your product, um, you're not going to make it to the finish line anyway. So um, you, you, got, you have to end up with a distinctive product. But I think communication has been one, inevitably, I think, one of the things that we've really found most interesting as we've gone through these weeks, where you've had some really top communicators of various levels. We've had writers, we've had editors, we've had bloggers, we've had influencers, and they're all talking about how do we talk about, how do we communicate about wine as we move forward? to be a wine communicator i slightly hate the term but i think you know you need to be good at public speaking i think yeah. you need to be good at education um because j just just making a living as a wine writer unless you know you're in a new york times ft situation which you know there are two of those in the world um it's it's not it's not going to happen basically you know you you could get a good fee for for speaking in public to a bunch of lawyers or doctors or something for the evening to earn the same amount of money writing journalism would probably take you a month of research and, yeah. and writing. Yeah. So th I think the things are moving in tandem at the moment. We've got communicators, we've got producers who are having to change what they do and the way things have been done. So now we have producers who are now having to sell directly, who are never doing so before, and are having to communicate directly through virtual tastings and other activities. And you've got wine writers who used to just send some words off to, to an editor to be published, who are also having, as Tim Atkin explains, having to do other things. They're having to, to actually run tastings, they're having to go online, they're having to communicate in all sorts of different ways that go beyond what they were used to. So we had Elizabeth Schneider on, and Elizabeth is one of my very favorite people in wine. And one of the things that I so enjoy is her frankness about uh, how the wine world communicates with our known tribe versus the audience that she has grown being, you know, one of the most well-established wine podcasters. And it is a reflection of, as she says, normal people. And that's also a lot of what we're seeing in the communication is that we must learn better how to speak with normal people. People, regular people, like regular normal people, smart people. And I'm not talking about like, I hate when people say ordinary people. I feel like normal people has a different connotation than ordinary. I'm, I'm, this, many of these people are extraordinary. However, we all have the same thing in mind when I'm thinking about normal. You know, you're great at your job, you're good at your life, and yet when you move into wine, somehow all of a sudden you become the schmo idiot down the street. I really did not like that. So instead, I just decided we're gonna, I'm gonna change the dialogue and make sure that when I'm talking about wine, it is not dumbed down, but it's ex explanatory. And communication is going to be different. Um, Elizabeth is the podcaster. You've now got people doing Instagram clips who are doing all sorts of different ways of getting the word across that were not imaginable five years ago, five, three years ago. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at virtual reality. We're going to look at augmented reality. We're going to look at all sorts of things that are coming. And by the time we have, God forbid, whenever it does come, the next pandemic, will we be doing Zoom like this or will we have holograms? What will the next thing be? Because let's be fair, nobody imagined that we'd all be communicating the way we are today, even a decade ago. And to be fair, that wine would take a back burner right now to other issues that are far bigger than what we're doing and that we have to come to accept, understand and embrace um, 
a, a multitude of messages, of markets, of audiences, and effectively we have to adapt. And I think that that, if we look at overarching messages that we have heard throughout the past 12 weeks, the adapt and evolve is one that comes up time and time again from people who are actually succeeding through crisis. And I think that's going to be a, an increasingly important part of, of, of what we're going to be talking about in the weeks and months that come, because it's not just COVID-19. We've still got this huge issue of climate change. And what are people going to be growing? How are they going to be growing? What sort of wines are they going to be, make? Are they going to be making? And for example, we had Jane Anson, the expert on Bordeaux, talking about new grapes, or in fact, old grapes being brought back into Bordeaux that haven't been used. I think what we'll see more much more and we already are seeing over the next de decade as a result of climate change is more Petit Verdo, more Malbec. You know, we'll see these kind of uh, grapes which are already allowed within the Bordeaux rules, but which have higher acidity and that resist better to, to, um, to fruit, to, sorry, to heat. I think it's not just the issues of the, the grapes that we're growing and the, the traditional wines that we're making, but also the changing landscape of what is going out to consumers on the shelves. We had Eric Asimov early on talking about his views of natural wine. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think natural wines have been one of the most um, interesting developments over the last 20 years and have... Um, uh, it's probably been the strongest influence, one of the strongest influences in the last uh, 10 or 15 years and how we, we think about wine and how... Um... Uh, we also had Alice Firing, who's the queen of the natural wine movement, sharing with us her thoughts on new legislation and ways of uh, distinguishing natural wine within existing markets. I think that that's something we've got to be looking for um, in the future. If for no reason then, it came up time and time again. I, I've been on record saying I'm a bit of an anarchist. I don't really see the need or I haven't seen the need for um, any sort of legislation about natural wine, but of course that was before natural wine became um, something that was worthy of imitation. And so I think that this is what the impetus coming out of France was about, is to try to allow the person shopping in the supermarket to know actually what they're getting and to have complete transparency. So I think it is unavoidable as we go forward to avoid any sort of legislation on it and how that's going to happen still remains to be seen. I think that what is going on with this 12 point system of wines by nature isn't necessarily legislation, it's a step in a direction to be seen what will happen. But I think that we're looking at the world today, it is shrinking. We had Nyan Gouda in South America making wine in a, in a lockdown village, in a place that we never thought of making that makes wine, talking about how he's using minimal input, but for commercial reasons. Personal preference is to use as few inputs as possible, um, no matter what the scale. Uh, so it, will take more work to do that because you'll have to essentially judge each batch that would come in on its individual merits and address any amelioration to that. Um, there are a number of reasons for doing that and it's not just a philosophical uh, reason, but I like the idea that I can be as hands off as possible. A lot of it has to do with the fact it makes financial sense to have as little input as possible because every input you have will cost you money and that will affect your margin. But we also had people from India, from South Africa, from Brazil, from Russia talking about their markets. And suddenly we're looking at a world in which maybe in the past that we talked about the UK and Germany and America. Now, if you're making wine or you're selling wine, you really do have to look a long way beyond those narrow old markets from the past. Yeah, and, and just coming back to that idea of infinite substitution, what we also have are infinite possibilities. And if I want to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned going through this process, I mean, we had four days 
to to plan for and create the very first one. And every one of those have been live recorded. We've made all of our mistakes in front of a very forgiving audience, but we have definitely learned valuable lessons about business, about communication, about evolution, about our own production. Well, I think that you and I both, I think what's different maybe from, from many people doing this kind of thing is that this has always been a sideline. We're not broadcasters. Um, we're not in a studio every day doing this. We both have another life or other lives in which we're consulting to people, giving them advice. And I've learned so much over the last 45 or more hours of these conversations. And there's lots of stuff I haven't agreed with. Of course there is. And somebody came back and said, you should have stepped on that or whatever it was. And that's not what we do. We want to hear lots of different voices saying lots of different things. And out of it comes all sorts of new thinking, the new thinking that we're going to need. Absolutely. And really about being more of a conversation than a prescription. I don't think that that was ever our goal when we started. I don't want to come in and tell people how to run their business. I want them to listen and learn and ask questions. And actually in all of that, maybe for better, uh, more open-minded networks for, you know, to whom they can go out to and ask the questions and find the answers that they need to grow. That's what we've done. I mean, we've had to, we've had to learn so much. I, I'll, I'll share a story um, that people may not see. We've had to hire post-production teams. We've had to bring on a producer. I mean, thank God for Anya. We, the, the research that we've had to learn to do in a very short time uh, has been, some days it has felt insurmountable. Um, I, I do think that leads into something that maybe we should share, which is a little bit of a change to the schedule that's coming in season two, um, because we all needed a bit of a breather and some life, which is instead of five days a week, live streaming, uh, we are actually going to be rolling these out on a schedule Monday, Wednesday, Friday, with today on Wednesday being the very first one. And we made the decision actually over the weeks that we just couldn't carry on doing something that was always at... 1900 European time, 1800 UK time, because that's not great for somebody who's in Australia or possibly in the West Coast of the US or in India or anywhere else. So now we're actually going to say, right, we're going to record these at times that are relevant to the people who are going to be in them. And we're still going to have audiences, but the audiences may have to get up in the middle of the night in order to be talking or to be listening to and talking to people who are actually talking to us in their daytime. But I, I think that is about the lessons that we've learned as well, which is while it might have been convenient for you in lockdown in the UK and me in lockdown in Spain to do it at six o'clock British time every night, it wasn't a reflection of the many voices and the takeaways that we can have in line um, and that we can do a better job at this accidental uh, mission if we remove some of those constraints and open the doors to more people. But in a way, that is really central to what I certainly have been saying, what you, I think, have been saying forever, which is that what the wine business has always been about is, this is what I make, this is what my father made, or the accountants told me to make, and you have got to take it. And instead of that, it's actually saying, what do you want to drink? What actually gives you pleasure as wine? How can we give that to you? And for us, creating these, what we're going to call all casts. And what's an all cast? An all cast is a combination of a webcast, a video recording, a podcast, and something you can read. Well, all of those are going to be designed, as we hope they've been so far, but even more so, to actually fit the needs of the people who are going to be accessing them. So how's that going to affect what we do in the future? Well, all casts like this are not going to exist to sell a brand or a region or anything else. But if people have come to us, which they have, saying, will you do something in partnership with us in a way that's openly badged as saying in partnership with X, Y, Z? Yes, of course, we'll talk about it. But it'll always be absolutely clear where we're coming from and we're not going to sell ourselves out. Yeah, we had a lot of questions I noticed on Twitter about whether we were planning on monetizing because we'd hit a certain number of, uh, of subscribers and viewers. And I think from the beginning, we were really clear that we were not, I mean, you and I aren't good at following other people's rules anyway. Um, and that that was not ever going to be a part of what we were producing, that we maintained full editorial control over everything that we did. And that I can't yeah. see that ever changing. 
I think it's really important though to acknowledge that we're selective in any partnerships that we do. This past season, we only chose to partner with one organization. We had, um, we had several requests and that organization was someone who really aligned with our values our goals for the wine industry, and someone who, you know, we could uh, we could share our audience and know that the lessons would be reflected across both organizations. And I think that that's important for any ongoing partnerships that we that we take on. So I know people have asked us if we have favorites, and it's kind of like saying that you have a favorite child. Um, there are certainly episodes that I've learned more from than others. Uh, but I, I do have to ask Robert, do you have a favorite clip? If you had to pick out something that, that really resonated with what we were trying to do these weeks. There are so many different ones, but actually there's one that stuck in my mind was Gary, was restaurateur, Gary Obligation saying what he had got out of the time we're going through now, which was the time to think. Hospitality in general, you know, being a, a sommelier or a wine director or a general manager of a hotel, whatever that thing is, uh, it's wash, rinse, repeat. We never get time to work on the projects. We, we always say there's going to be an opportunity. Maybe, you know, we'll get around to it. Maybe Q3 of next year. You know, we, we push these things out. Right now, we've got a window where we actually have time to complete some of these projects that we've put off forever. Now, are, is the government going to allow us to do it? Is it a central work to be done, you know, for a construction type project? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's a whole different factor. But to get out a notepad or whiteboard or a notebook and start really crafting, all right, what is a different way to think about this thing that I have been noodling on for sometimes years? And it's a rare opportunity that if, if I were talking to a sommelier right now or somebody who's looking for what do I do right now to prepare, it's get creative. It's take the time, take advantage of this non-renewable resource, because time, we don't get back. All those projects and ideas that one said, no, can't do it, too expensive, whatever, they've been brought down, dusted down, and think, hey, let's try it. That's what we've done with this. This was going to be a podcast we thought about months and months ago, and suddenly it became Real Business of Wine. And I'm looking forward to hearing lots more people telling us what has grown out of these last two or three months. How has the wine industry learned from what we've been going through and how is it going to go on learning? Um, I, I, yeah, I have to admit it was Maggie Enriquez from Krug who had a moment where she got teary as we were talking to her and talking about what the world was going to look like and that we're going to go on and we're going to give each other hugs and we will have all of these lessons from how difficult and upsetting uh, COVID and lockdown have been, but actually just a very empathetic, emotional, loving response to our audience. There is nothing that can replace the physical connection. And when life will give us the opportunity to see, a, and I am almost going to cry, but when you can see together, you know, you will, you will enjoy so much. You will uh, value so much the possibility of embracing people you love. So for me, you know, my big takeaway coming in, coming to the end of this recap is just enormous gratitude for the well over a hundred people who- 130. 130. 130 who gave their time on short notice to come and share very honest stories with us and with our audience. And it's, it's no exaggeration to say we could not have done this without their care and cooperation. And I'm looking forward to what comes next. I'm looking forward to the next 130 and the conversations we're going to have that are going to spread even wider than everything we've done so far. Because what I've often felt at the end of the hour I said, well, we could go on for another hour, another two hours with so many strands that we could follow up on. And that's what I'm looking forward to doing. So what is next for us? Tell us about the weeks ahead. So we're not doing five days a week. We're going to do three days. And on each of those days, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're going to post online at the same time. So if you want to know what's going to be on, actually come join us, subscribe. And if you want to attend any of those, sign up for them because we've had all sorts of bandwidth issues and I fear that's not going to go away. So we are going to limit ourselves to a maximum of 100 people per session. So if you want to be there, please sign up. And the other thing is, if you want to actually be kept 
up to date with what videos are going to be up, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, so subscribe on the website to the newsletter, subscribe on YouTube to get the latest videos. And another thing that we have started asking for that I think is so important is if give us suggestions. If there's a topic you want to hear about, if there's a person you'd love to speak to, there's a form on the website now, fill it out and tell us. When we came up with the idea of the real business of wine, it was because ProVine, the exhibition in Dusseldorf, wasn't happening. And this was an event where the wine industry got together in one place. And we thought, why can't we do that online? And that's what we're going to continue doing. And so the more of you who can come up with conversations and ideas, the better we'll be. Thank you for being a great partner in all of this, Robert. And thank you, Polly, because without you and your team behind the scenes who don't, necessarily, don't get the credit they deserve, we would never have done any of this. So thank you all and thank everyone. Teamwork. Actually, and thank you for everyone who's joined us on the ride. And as I've said, or tried to say at the end of each of our sessions, stay safe.